Welcome to a new series of talks from Radstock Baptist Church. We're aiming to take you through the entire Bible in a year, 52 sessions through the books of the Bible. Obviously you can do it in whatever time frame you like. We're just aiming for a year to cover the whole book. So naturally enough we start week one with the book of Genesis, which means the origin or formation of something. Let's start with a general oversight, not in terms of events, but of people. The book of Genesis runs from Adam all the way through to Joseph. As such, it takes in many of the Bible giants, as you can see on the slide. Abraham, Noah, Jacob, Enoch, Isaac, and many more. It's also worth noting that the book of Genesis covers a period of nearly two and a half thousand years which is roughly the same as the rest of the Bible. Of course, part of the reason for this timescale is the very long lives of several characters. Methuselah is well known for living 969 years, but he's not alone. Noah, Adam, Seth, as well as the lesser known Jared, Kenan and Enos, all lived for more than 900 years. In fact, Adam did not die until Lamech was 56. Lamech was Noah's father and the sixth great grandson of Adam. Of course, many people cite this as one of the reasons they do not believe the Genesis story is accurate. But actually, it's easily explainable. Genesis tells us that God created the heavens and the earth, and he created something called a firmament. This was like a protective shell around the earth that would protect against UV, IR and other issues. Then in Genesis 7, during the flood, we read that the floodgates of heaven opened, which would have seen the removal of the firmament. As can be seen from the diagram, as soon as the flood subsides, those who were born in the reborn earth with a new atmosphere all have a lifespan greatly reduced and on a par with that which we experience today. Genesis begins with the creation and finishes in the very last verse with the death of Joseph. The book was actually written by Moses despite the fact he was not born until 280 years after Joseph's death. This was very much an era and a civilization where facts and information were passed down in great detail from generation to generation. Genesis begins with the account of God creating the heavens, the earth and everything in them. The very first verse states that God began his creation by making the heavens and the earth. Then on the first day of creation he created light. Was the creation of the heavens and the earth a day zero or was it an unspecified period earlier? Some people claim there was a gap, mainly in an attempt to explain the apparent age of the earth. Others say the context appears to imply a continuity. The truth is that the Bible doesn't say either way, and we certainly should not interpret the Bible to try to fit our understanding. We must adapt our understanding to what the Bible says. Where the Bible is silent, as it is here, it is wise not to speculate. On day two, God created the sky over the earth. The following day, he separated the water on the earth from the dry land, forming seas, oceans and rivers. He also created all the plants and trees. On the fourth day, God created the sun, the moon and all the stars. Now, of course, many people have questioned how the creation periods can be referred to as days if the sun was not created until day four. The answer is clear, because the Bible says so. Not only that, but in a possible attempt to underline this truth, the passage explicitly defines the day as an evening and a morning. On day five, God created not only fish, but every creature that lives in the sea. Not only birds, but every creature that flies in the air. Then on day six, the final day of creation, God created every land animal. The final creative act, the pinnacle of God's work, 
was to create man, the creature God made in his own image, and into whom he breathed his own breath. Deciding that it was not good that this man, Adam, should be alone, God took one of his ribs and used this to create the woman, Eve. In creating man, God made something unique. But in creating Eve, he created something very different. He created humankind, a society, a civilization. On day seven, the Bible states that God rested from his work, thereby creating a special holy day. Did God need to rest? Well, clearly not in the sense that we understand it. But he was certainly establishing the principle of a holy day of rest. Sadly, the perfection of creation didn't last long, and we witness God's ultimate creatures disobeying him and sinning. Both the man and the woman fell. The order is irrelevant, as is the encouragement and deception of the devil working through the serpent. The Bible is clear that every individual is ultimately responsible for their own actions. At the same time, we see the beginning of sin, we see two other things that remain with us today, making excuses for sin, and blaming others for our sin. The fact is there is no excuse or justification for wrongdoing, and Adam and Eve were banished from the Garden of Eden and the entrance to the garden was permanently sealed. Adam and Eve had been instructed to be fruitful and multiply, and had several children, although only the three oldest sons are mentioned by name, Cain, Abel and Seth. We see that from the very beginning there are principles established that carry through the entire Bible. Man is seen as a worshipping being, only one of God's creatures who worship their creator. Both Cain and Abel seek to worship God. Abel, a shepherd, makes sacrifice of one of his sheep. His older brother Cain is a farmer and uses his crops to create his offering. God is pleased with Abel's sacrifice but rejects Cain. Even at this early stage we learn that to please the holy God requires the shedding of blood. Cain is jealous of God's acceptance of Abel's offering and so becomes the first murderer in killing his brother. He is banished to the land of Nod. The population of the world continues to grow, and as it did so, man became increasingly wicked. Sin has such a hold on the human race that God regrets ever making them, and he decides to wipe them out and start again. To begin over, God chooses Noah and his family, because Noah was a very righteous man warning Noah that there would be a worldwide flood. He's told to build a boat with specific dimensions given, large enough to house Noah, his three sons, or four wives, as well as two of every kind of animal for future repopulation. He was to take an additional five animals of each clean species for the feeding of carnivores and omnivores. Again, people question the feasibility of this. The account clearly states a length of about 140 metres, a width of 23 metres and a height of 14 metres, yielding a capacity of about 1,200 cubic metres, enough, somebody has calculated, for about 125,000 sheep. Today there are fewer than 18,000 species of animal, and it wouldn't be massively different in Noah's day. Taking seven of each of the clean animals and two of the others would be about 45,000 animals. Now, clearly some animals are larger than the sheep, but actually the majority are smaller, which shows that actually only about a third of the boat would be full of animals, leaving two thirds for storage, food and for Noah and his family. The story is so well known, it needs little additional comment. The family and the animals were shut in the boat, and seven days later it began to rain. It rained continually for 40 days and 40 nights, and then, obviously, they had to wait for the waters to subside before returning to the earth. 
Overall, they were on the boat for 370 days. Tragically, one of the first things God's chosen man did on returning to dry land was to get drunk. As Jesus would later confirm, there is none righteous, no, not one. The next couple of chapters outline the genealogy from Noah to Abraham, and a very significant development in the world. Noah was the last man to live in excess of 900 years, and as such was still alive when Abraham was born, his eight greats grandson. The passage outlines man's attempt to reach God their own way rather than following God's path. They built a huge tower, the Tower of Babel, reaching up towards heaven in the hope that this would aid them in their quest. Due to their rebellion, God scatters mankind around the world, confusing their communication with a multiplicity of languages. We first meet Abraham in chapter 11, when he, his wife Sarai, his father Terah, and his nephew Lot, leave their home to head to Canaan. They only got as far as Haran when they settled there, and God calls Abraham, makes a covenant with him, promising to make Abraham's descendants into a great nation. Throughout his travels, Abraham erects a number of altars as symbols of his devotion to God. Abraham stays briefly in Egypt, where he becomes wealthy before returning to Canaan. Several armies from the east attack Sodom, where Lot has settled, so Abraham gathers just 318 men and defeats the armies. A small story which is frequently overlooked because Abraham is generally not considered a warrior. Melchizedek the priest, who will be mentioned again briefly in the book of Hebrews, gives Abraham a gift of bread and wine, a clear foretaste of our Lord's communion. God repeats his assurance of the blessing on Abraham's de descendants, who, he is told, will be incredibly numerous. God assures him that his word will not be broken. But Abraham remains mystified at these promises. His faith remains strong, which is counted to him as righteousness. But God has promised a mighty nation would come from him. At this stage, Abraham is 85, just 10 years older than Sarai, his wife. So any prospect of children appear very unlikely from a human perspective. But of course, we're not considering a human perspective. Sarai, at 75, has decided her childbearing years have gone. So she decides to give God a helping hand by giving her handmaiden Hagar to her husband in the hope that she would produce the longed-for heir. This giving of the servant for procreation seems very odd to us, but it was standard practice back in those times. The liaison was successful, and Abraham becomes a father for the first time at the age of 86, when Hagar gives birth to Ishmael. The name means God hears. However, God tells Abraham that Ishmael is not the child of promise. He will be a father of a vast nation, but not of God's chosen nation. Despite their age, Abraham and Sarai will indeed have their own child who shall be called Isaac. It is at this stage that God changes the names of Abraham and Sarai to Abraham and Sarah. God then appears to Abraham in the form of three men who declare to the 90-year-old Sarah that she will have a son. She laughs at the news. The three men travel on to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy them because of their continuous wickedness. Abraham pleads on the city's behalf, hoping to save his nephew Lot. The messengers persuade Lot to flee the city with his wife, his unmarried daughters, and tell them not to look back as they leave. However, as God rains down burning punishment on Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot's wife looks back at her home, and she is turned into a pillar of salt. Lot and his two unmarried daughters make it safety. 
His married daughters had married evil people from the towns and so perished. In fleeing, Lot lost his married daughters, his sons-in-law, his grandchildren, other relatives, his friends, and every possession he had. A timely reminder that we must not allow anything or anyone to keep us from fleeing to salvation. Meanwhile, Sarah does give birth to Isaac at the age of 90, with Abraham now a hundred years old. Abraham sends Hagar and Ishmael away following a request from Sarah. God then gives Abraham his toughest test to date, telling him to kill his son Isaac as a sacrifice. As the place of sacrifice was getting closer, Abraham was struggling. He had wrestled with the matter in his heart a thousand times since God had spoken. As he was thinking, his servants ran up and suggested a time of rest. The sun was very hot and the old man agreed to stop for a while. The animals were tied down and the servants both lay down under a tree to sleep. Beside him stood Isaac. He said, Isaac, my son, come and sit with me a while. Isaac came and sat with his father. Heat made him tired and he quickly fell asleep. Abraham turned his eyes to his son and he knew what he had to do. As Abraham heads to sacrifice Isaac, we consider who Isaac was. Isaac was a gift. Isaac was a promise. Isaac was Abraham's beloved son. God had promised to make Abraham a mighty nation through Isaac. And Abraham believed God, but nothing had ever happened. God had promised to make Abraham's descendants through the son he was holding as numerous as the stars. And God keeps his word. But now God asks Abraham to sacrifice the one thing that had an opportunity to become another God in his life. For Abraham, that was Isaac, his special child. He was the son who was going to fulfill the promise of God. From this son, his descendants were going to multiply. For a person who wants to walk with God, there's only one option when an Isaac begins to take the place of God. That Isaac must die. The old man, his son and the servants were three days into a journey when they stopped. Abraham gave orders for a camp to be set up and the servants began their work. Abraham began to examine and make sure he had everything. He had the wood, the fire, the knife. Could he obey God and do what had been commanded? He looked at his son Isaac. Perhaps he had put too much trust in him. After all, it was God that had given Isaac to him. As he made the final preparations for Isaac and him to go on alone, he was sure in his heart he would sacrifice his son to God. God would be given the rightful place in his heart. Abraham helped put the wood on Isaac's back and the two of them headed off to the place of sacrifice. Whenever we have an Isaac that we have lifted up, God will eventually ask that we sacrifice it. We cannot have two gods. Your Isaac will often be the thing that you trust in dearly, and it's hard to be asked to willingly give it up. God comes through and asks us to trust in him, not in the gifts that he has given us. Sometimes we don't realise how tough it was for Abraham. He was going to kill everything that God had promised and given to him. Yet, he was still willing to trust God. When Abraham takes Isaac to the mountains, Isaac asks what animal they're going to sacrifice. And Abraham replies that God will provide an offering. In fact, in a glorious anticipation of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus, Abraham explicitly tells his son God will provide himself a sacrifice. Not God will provide for himself, as often stated, but God will provide himself. 
The most beautiful part of this story comes with the revelation of a name of God, Jehovah Jireh. When I reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar, on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he said. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. For I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. God never wanted to see Isaac physically sacrificed. He wanted Isaac to be sacrificed in Abraham's heart. Once God knew that Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac, God stepped in and stopped it. The sacrifice had already been made. God steps in though and provides a ram to be offered in place of Isaac. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. God wants to bring us to the place of sacrifice with our Isaac. The things that we have been blessed with have become what we bless. God wants us to sacrifice them. For Abraham, God saw that the sacrifice had been made in his heart. Following Sarah's death, Abraham sends his servant to find a wife for Isaac. The servant prays to be guided for the correct wife for Isaac, and God leads him to Rebekah, whom he brings back to Isaac. Isaac and Rebekah marry, and shortly afterwards, Abraham dies. Before leaving Abraham, it's important to reflect on some key lessons from his life. We see at the very beginning of his account, he began moving forward in faith, even though neither the direction nor the end point were clear. His faith is also an example to us in that it was consistently a combination of both believing and doing. God told Abraham he would have a child, so Sarah gave him her servant. Perhaps the lesson here for us is to be careful who we take advice from. Finally, the 90-year-old Sarah does have her baby, teaching us that the impossible is not always impossible. Twice did Abraham split from the people he was close to. First his nephew, then his eldest son and his mother. Here he shows that sometimes it's simply better to separate if remaining together would lead to more unpleasantness. His willingness to sacrifice Isaac when God called him should encourage us to be willing to give up everything for God. Perhaps the final lesson from Abraham will not be relevant to many, but I imagine it will encourage a few. Abraham teaches us that if your motives are right, you can be both godly and wealthy. In Isaac, we see several parallels with the Lord Jesus Christ. Theologians refer to this as Isaac being a type of Christ. Both had their birth foretold in advance. Both were named in advance. And both had a supernatural birth. Like Jesus, Isaac was offered up by his father, willingly submitted and was ultimately delivered. As the church is referred to as the bride of Christ and is chosen by God, so Isaac had his bride selected by his father. God reveals to Rebecca that she will give birth to twin boys who will represent two nations, one stronger than the other. Esau is born first and is extremely hairy. Jacob, who is smooth skinned, is born immediately afterwards grasping the heel of his brother. 
Isaac's two sons grow to be opposites. Esau is a hunter, a strong and coarse man. Jacob stays at home, soft-spoken but quick-witted. One day Esau comes home from his hunting, feeling really hungry. He demands to be fed, and after some negotiation, he agrees to give Jacob his inheritance rights in exchange for a bowl of soup. Like his father, Isaac does well in Canaan, becoming quite wealthy, making alliances with regional rulers and erecting monuments to God. When he's old and blind, he tells Esau to hunt and prepare a meal so that he can give him the blessing as the eldest son. However, Rebekah helps Jacob deceive his father, preparing a separate meal and disguising the younger son with hairy arms using animal skins and Esau's clothing for the smell. When Jacob presents Isaac with the meal, Isaac smells Esau's clothing, feels his hairy body, and so he proceeds to bless Jacob, promising the, him the inheritance of God's covenant and a greater status than his brother. Esau returns to discover the deception, but it's too late. Isaac, though clearly upset at what has happened, says he cannot revoke the stolen blessing. Well, Jacob is now scared of his older brother, who may be out for revenge, and so he runs to the home of his uncle Laban in Upper Mesopotamia. On the way, he dreams of a stairway leading up to heaven where God and his angels reside. God promises Jacob the same covenant he had previously made with both Jacob's father and grandfather, Isaac and Abraham. Jacob arrives at Laban's house where he agrees to work for his uncle for seven years in exchange for the hand of Laban's daughter, Rachel, in marriage. Laban deceives Jacob into marrying Leah, Rachel's older sister, before marrying Rachel after he's worked for another seven years. There is, of course, a real irony in the situation. Jacob, who's been guilty of deception and manipulation, certainly doesn't like this taste of his own medicine. Unsurprisingly, a competitive relationship developed between Rachel and Leah. It's interesting that Rachel is clearly Jacob's favourite wife. But the tribe of Judah, the line of David, and therefore ultimately the Lord Jesus, is descended from Leah, not from Rachel. Although Leah was not favoured by Jacob, she was favoured by God. She lived longer and had more children. The two wives compete for Jacob's favour and along with their maids give birth to 11 sons and a daughter. A 12th son is born sometime later. 20 years later, Jacob responds to God's calling and heads off to return to Canaan, taking his family and his flocks with him. Unknown to Jacob, his wife Rachel has also taken her father Laban's collection of idols. She hides them under her skirt when Laban tracks down the fleeing clan in the desert. Unable to locate his belongings, Laban settles his differences with Jacob, who erects a pillar of stone as a witness to God of their peaceful resolution. Jacob continues on, and, nearing home, fears an encounter with Esau. Jacob prepares gifts to appease his brother and, dividing his family and belongings into two camps, spends the night alone by the river Jabbok. Jacob meets God, who, disguised as a man, physically wrestles with Jacob until dawn. Jacob demands a blessing from his opponent and the man blesses Jacob. It is at this moment when God renames Jacob Israel, a name which means he struggles with God. The following morning, Jacob does meet Esau, who welcomes his brother with open arms. Jacob resettles at Shechem, not far from Esau. Jacob and his sons prosper in peace until one day Jacob's daughter Dinah is raped. 
range, Jacob's sons say they will let the man marry Dinah if all the members of the man's family will be circumcised. The man agrees, and while the greater part of his village are healing from surgical procedure, Jacob's sons, Levi and Simeon, take revenge and attack the village, killing all the men. Both Isaac and Rachel die soon after this. Jacob's sons grow jealous of their youngest brother, Joseph, who is Jacob's favourite. When Jacob presents Joseph with a beautiful multicoloured coat, the ten elder brothers have finally had enough. They sell Joseph into slavery, telling their father that Joseph is dead, taking his special coat, covered in blood, back with them. Joseph is sold to Potiphar, a high-ranking official in Egypt, who favours the boy until one day Potiphar's flirtatious wife accuses Joseph of trying to sleep with her after he turned down her advances. Potiphar throws Joseph in prison, but... Remaining faithful to God, Joseph earns a reputation as an interpreter of dreams. Years pass until the pharaoh Imenemat II of Egypt is deeply troubled by two dreams. He hears of Joseph and his abilities. The pharaoh summons Joseph, who successfully interprets the dreams, warning pharaoh that a great famine will strike Egypt after seven years. Given his obvious abilities, Pharaoh elects Joseph to be his highest official, and Joseph leads a campaign throughout Egypt to set aside food in preparation for the famine. Famine eventually plagues the land, and learning of the Egyptian supply of grain, Joseph's brothers go to Egypt to purchase food. The eleven men present themselves to Joseph, who recognises them immediately. They don't recognise him, since he's aged and appears as a high-ranking Egyptian official. Joseph tests his brother's goodwill, first throwing them in jail, then sending them back to Canaan to retrieve their newest brother, Benjamin. They return with the boy, and Joseph continues his game, planting a silver cup in the boy's satchel, and threatening to kill the boy when the cup is discovered. When Judah offers his own life in exchange for Benjamin's, Joseph reveals his identity. Joseph persuades his brothers to return to Egypt with Jacob, who, overjoyed, moves to Egypt with his entire family of 70 people. There are five truths about forgiveness we can learn from the life of Joseph. We must give ourselves time and be the initiator. Wounds take time to heal. Joseph met with his brothers after 20 years. It was a long time. But time helped to heal deep wounds. Time also helps us reflect. It helps us realise that some things in life are not really worth fighting for. We have to be like Joseph. He was a peacemaker. He wasn't concerned about his brother's attitude toward him. But instead, he took the initiative to forgive. When we reach out to the other, we're doing exactly what the Lord did for us. Secondly, specify the problem and talk about it. Forgiveness is not about overlooking a problem or evading an issue. In fact, Joseph reminded his brothers of their act. I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. He didn't try to minimise or hide the truth, but he also didn't venture into the blame game. He said to them, this is what separated us, but I'm willing to forgive you and start all over. Third, talk about your relationship with the other. Ask yourself, what brought you together in the first place? Joseph not only identified himself as the brother, but also asked, is my father still alive? Showing that family relationships are important. Fourth, be willing to forgive, even if you're the victim. 
Joseph never forgot. He actually reminded his brothers of the wrong. He never harboured resentment, because in the very next verse it says, Do not be angry with yourselves that you did this to me. God is always present in the midst of brokenness. Joseph was able to see God in their situation too. He told his brothers, God sent me before you to preserve life. Nothing escapes God's notice. Perhaps he's watching to see if we will honour him. Forgiveness may not be easy, but if we claim to be a child of God, we have to do it. And finally, show your feelings. After introducing himself to his brothers, Joseph wept loudly, but the Egyptians standing outside heard it. Then he said, come closer to me. Twenty years of bitterness that distanced the brothers were broken when they were invited to get close to Joseph. Joseph kissed his brothers and wept over them. His brothers never rejoiced as much as he did. That's okay. Don't expect too much from the other side. You do your part and do it for the glory of God. This life is too short to harbour bitterness. As Jacob approaches the end of his life, he promises Joseph that the covenant will pass on through Joseph and his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. However, when Jacob places his hands on the boys to bless them, he crosses his arms, placing the right on Ephraim, the younger son, and the left on Manasseh. Joseph protests, but Jacob says that Ephraim will be greater than Manasseh. There appears to be no massively significant reason for this, other than the emphasis that, while the world will always favour the older, the spirit will look for other reasons of choice. No doubt in his mind, Jacob clearly remembered how he had usurped Esau. His father Isaac had overtaken Ishmael. And even Joseph himself was a son of favour despite being the eleventh born. Jacob dies soon thereafter, and, accompanied by the Egyptians, Joseph buries his father in Canaan. The family returned to Egypt, where Jacob's descendants, the Israelite people, grow rapidly. Joseph eventually dies, instructing his family to return one day to the land God has promised to give to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Opposing elements generate both irony and reversals in the stories of Isaac, Jacob and Joseph. Esau does not merely receive a lesser blessing because Jacob steals his inheritance, but is actually cursed to serve his younger brother forever, barred from the covenant entirely. Characters are increasingly deceptive in these stories, and their skill at deception perhaps surprisingly earns them praise and privilege rather than punishment. Jacob deceives Esau and as a result becomes the founder of one of the greatest nations in the Old Testament. Laban deceives Jacob and receives twice as many years of service from him as a result. Jacob's sons trick the Shechemites in order to murder them. The most interesting deception is Joseph's decision to veil his identity from his brothers. When Judah offers his life for Benjamin, Joseph forgives his brothers. Trickery is replaced by the possibility of redemption, foreshadowing God's plan to reverse the Israelites' fortune with the promise of abundance in a new land. Joseph, the ancestor of the Israelites, never has an explicit conversation with God, yet he notes in the final chapter of Genesis that the happy outcome of the first trick his brothers play on him has helped him save many lives in Egypt. The experience of Joseph and Jacob shows that God's covenant is fulfilled largely through the act of struggling. Many New Testament themes have their roots in the book of Genesis. The Lord Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman referred to in chapter 3, who will destroy Satan's power. Noah and his family are the first of many remnants shown throughout the Bible, 
Despite overwhelming circumstances, God always preserves the faithful remnant for himself. Faith demonstrated by Abraham would be the gift of God and the basis for all future salvation for both Jew and Gentile. The overriding theme of Genesis is God's eternal existence and his creation. There is no attempt to defend the existence of God. The author simply states that God is, always was and always will be, almighty over all. All people, regardless of culture, nationality or language, are accountable to the Creator. But because of sin introduced into the fall, into the world at the fall, we are separated from him. But through one small nation, Israel, God's redemptive plan for mankind was revealed and made available to all. We now rejoice in that plan. We can trust him to handle the concerns of our lives. God can take a hopeless situation like Abraham and Sarah being childless and do amazing things if we will simply Trust and obey. The book concludes with the death of Joseph. Just before that, Joseph tells his brothers that although they had intended their actions for evil, God intended it for good. This brings us straight back to the cross and the Lord Jesus. His accusers, and indeed the world in general, intended it for evil. But God clearly created the ultimate good. Terrible and unjust things may happen in our lives, as with Joseph, but God will always bring about a greater good if we have faith in him and his sovereign plan. If you would like to know more, then do contact us at any of the contact addresses given on this slide, or if you are ever in Radstock on a Sunday morning, come along to Radstock Baptist Church for our 10.30 service. You would always be very welcome. <laughs>